Hey everyone, it's Classic DM. Welcome back to another first edition Advanced Dungeon Dragons tutorial type uh, show. And this one's going to become as a special request from one of our viewers. Uh, basically, they had, you know, a lot of people are getting a chance to pick up some of the old uh, first edition books. Uh, they have friends that got copies of them, or they've been playing fifth edition and want to try something new. And one person, uh, Reese G, said, hey, I've been trying to get into one, uh, first edition AD&D, but I have no clue about how to get into the combat and sequences should work. Um, seriously, there is no good videos anywhere on how combat works in AD&D first edition. Do you think you could help me out and possibly make an in-depth video on combat, or at least how you would run it? Thanks, and keep up the cool videos. Hey, that's awesome. Fantastic. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to dedicate this one to you, dude. So this will probably be about an hour, maybe the longest. If it gets too long, I'll break it up into individual pieces. But you do need two things. So the first thing you need, you need your PDF copy of the Player's Handbook and your PDF copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Be sure to get the re-release that was done in like 2012 and 13. I've written a couple page numbers down. I'll try to put that kind of stuff in the comments. Uh, we just got a real basic goofy map here that we laid out a long time ago. And we'll just pick our druid. So we have our druid in the scene and let's put some unpainted bugbears in the scene, okay? Let's say these unpainted bugbears are dorking around with this uh, altar thing, right? We'll put a couple of... Uh, bugbear tokens at this fountain screwing around with this fountain or something like that right so you got let's get these other kids out of the way so say you just have a druid by herself um in fact let's make it even more nasty let's say we've got a, the rogue sneaking hide in shadows and he comes into this area here and he made a successful hide in shadows check and he sees this room and the dm tells him that okay you see these two bugbears hanging out near this like well and you've got these other two jokers here checking out this big large uh, idol or something there's a couple of torches burning and then the smoke's kind of going being drawn that way and some torches are burning coming along here and these all is a torch lit room right these big massive stone pillars and these guys are futzing around and climb up here and talk to each other and bugbear and these guys are you know playing with the water and then kind of going back and looking down the hallway maybe they're kind of nervously worrying about something coming that way so you got your thief or your rogue or this guy here sneaking up and you're going to have a combat situation how does it get started what's the first thing you got to do how do you need to understand how it's going to work um the good thing is it's not that complicated in first edition it's actually pretty straightforward so we'll zoom this in a little bit to the little different camera perspective and let's kill this light here that light there is making it too crazy so here's our rogue hiding in shadows we see this dude right here and he's over here by this pillar let's say he hides behind this pillar and he checks out the room so one of the first things you can do is you can go to your Dungeon Master's Guide, like page 61, and there's a lot of content that talks about surprise, okay? Surprise is really quite simple. It doesn't take three pages to describe it. All it's trying to do is say, okay, let's say the, a rogue ran in the room. Let's get these guys out of the way. And it was a bugbear standing this way, and just about the time, he's standing looking this way, right? So... Just like anyone else in the world, this guy's got about a 180 degree field of view. So he's looking at his buddy down the hallway saying, hey, I can't open the door. So he's pretty much kind of looking at his friend over here. And you come running down the hallway and you can't see him, right? Because you can't see past this, uh, you can't see him. So when you get to about here, you entered, you see him, but you can't see this guy, and he can see you. So that's kind of like we, we ran around the corner and bumped into each other. So those are situations where you want to check for what's called surprise. And surprise is really kind of a glorified way of saying the first initiative role. Okay? So let's just say that were to happen. So we had, say we had one bugbear down the hallway talking to his other friend Grunk or something, and you're just running down the hallway. Let's say you're playing, uh, I don't know, let's say you're playing Mercedes. So Mercedes from our show, our level 12 fighter. Let's give you a shot of what she looks like, right? So here's Mercedes. Mercedes, she's a real death machine. She's playing in the Glacier Rift of Frost Giant Jarl. She comes whipping down the hallway. And she sees the bugbear captain, and he sees her. The first thing you want to do is roll for surprise. Now, the way this does this is it's going to be, um, you do this with D6 dice. I don't do this as much as I should, but verbatim, Here's how the rule is. Basically, there'd be 1d6 roll for the bad guys, 1d6 roll for you, and if it's just one person, you're gonna get your dexterity adjustment, okay? So in the first edition, if you go all the way back up to the ability scores, uh, you'll see that, um, let's go down, here's your strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, there's a table here and this thing called reaction attacking adjustment. That's this right here, see this? So let's see what Sadie has. 
Mercedes, level 12 fighter. She would destroy these guys, no problem. But she only has, she has a 16 strength, 16 intelligence, 14 wisdom, 15 dex. So she doesn't have a reaction to attacking just with nothing. It's just a dash. That's this part right here. But she's minus one to her armor class. So for her, she doesn't get a bonus to this roll. But the way it talks about this in the first edition is it wants you to roll a six-sided dice for them and a six-sided dice for you. So say you roll a four for the bugbear and you roll a six. There's no adjustment for her. There's no adjustment for you. So what they're trying to do is low rolls are bad. So in first edition, it's kind of like you want to roll the highest number possible. So you're going to roll to hit something, and you want to roll a natural 20. You want to make a saving throw, you want to roll a natural 20. You, um, nothing really is about low rolls. And remember, uh, surprise is not initiative. It's just that very first determination of what the devil's going on, what's going to happen. So what it wants to do is it wants to look at this little table here, which is a page 62, okay? Um, this is this one right here. Very simple. What did you roll? Okay, we rolled a six. That's really good. You want a high number. The other guy rolls a four. So if you roll a three to six, and a monster rolls between three and six, there's no surprise. So when that happens, you immediately go to an initiative roll. Now an initiative roll is three d six for you, and three d six for you. So in that situation, you're going to have a. Uh, he's going to have his bonus from his. If it, the bugbear had a high dexterity or something, he'd have a bonus. So you have an initiative roll for the bugbear and an initiative roll for Mercedes, and she could add her bonus. So 5, 6, 7, 8, plus the 4 is what, 12? And this is a 6, and a 6 is a 16. So that means the bugbear sees you, and you see her, and neither one of you are surprised. That means you aren't like, huh, what's going on? Um, that means you can start attacking. So he can either decide to flee and make the first move. If he had a bow in his hand, he could shoot first because he won the initiative roll. So the initiative roll determines who goes first. Now, once that's happened, the two of you keep trading blows back and forth forever until somebody dies or someone tries to disengage from the fight. Now, there's something interesting that I like to do that a lot of people don't do. I like to use a grouping system. And you'll see some um, notes in the Dungeon Master's Guide about this. So let's, let's go back to our original situation where the bugbear is looking this way. Mercedes came and running the door. We roll for surprise. Now, let's say that Mercedes rolled a, a 1 and the bugbear rolled a six. Okay, let's put a six up there for him. So what did that mean? Let's go back to the surprise table. So if you look at this table again, so the party, meaning players, you rolled a one, and the uh, uh, one or a two, and if the bugbear rolled a one to six, then your, your party is considered surprised. So what does that mean? That means there is a differential to take in consideration between the six and the one to determine how many segments he can do things before you're able to gather your thoughts or get a grip on your sword or maybe you're like surprised and flat-footed. Have you ever had like a friend come around the corner and scare you like, oh, you're really scared? So it's a situation where you're just totally unprepared. Like you look out the corner of your eye, you think you see something, and by the time you turn and look, it's already hit you. It's like driving your car through an intersection and suddenly someone cuts in front of you. You're surprised. So surprise means you're not aware. You're not... It's not that you're afraid. Um, it means you are unaware. You weren't, don't have your thoughts about you. you. It takes you a second to kind of gather your thoughts. That only ever happens the very first time two characters see each other simultaneously. So if there was a situation where there was two bugbears and one was on this side of the pool and one was on that side of the pool and Mercedes came whipping down the hallway like this, he would see you and you would see her. So you might roll a surprise roll for this group of bugbears, which means both of these guys, and you might so it would be Mercedes versus the bugbear. So say in that situation, Mercedes rolled a one, which is terrible, and the bugbears roll a four. You look at the little table there. So she rolled a one in between a three and six. That means she's like, "Whoa, I'm surprised." That would mean that he's like his facial expressions. He would be able to mumble something. His buddy would go, "Hey, what's going on?" and turn around quickly and be able to help. So then the two of them could close the gap and start attacking her, and she'd be like, "Whoa, flat-footed." So that's pretty nasty. Um, if you, it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean a situation like this. Okay, let's clear this off again real quick. Um, in fact, I think this video would just cover surprise and initiative. Let's say there's a bugbear standing here and a bugbear standing here, and they're standing guard for some reason. And Mercedes comes running down the hallway. Clang, 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 clang. The DM might roll for noise. So say she's just walking quietly down the hallway because she sees the torchlight. She thinks she sees the shadow of, of something on the ground here and something over here. She, she knows something's going in the room, so she's walking slowly. She's got her two-handed sword out, and she gets to about right here. 
she could hear or smell the side of these guys as she comes around this corner here and see part of their bodies. And if she's not making a lot of noise, um, she might get a jump on them first, but they might hear her. So in this situation, you probably want to roll a surprise roll. So let's do it, right? So for the bugbears, I got a one. And for Mercedes, she got a six. That's a fantastic situation. So she actually completely surprises them. Now, you heard me mention a moment ago how you need to compare the numbers. If you look up on 61, this tells you how many segments of action you lose, okay? So we need to talk about time real quick before we talk about what that really means. So in the first edition, let's put it this way. And this, they changed this in fifth edition to make it much more easy to work with. In the first edition, there's three things of time. You have a round, and above that is a turn, and then you have a segment. And it's really quite easy. A turn is supposed to be 10 minutes, a round is supposed to be one minute, a segment is six seconds. So everything's divided by 10. If you divide this by 10, you get one. If you divide this by 10, you get six, because there's six segments in a minute. So when you're playing the game and you're riding your horse between the village of Hamlet and some ruined moat house, it might take you two turns to get there, which is 20 minutes, right? Uh, it takes you how long it takes you to jump in your car and go to ATM machine. It might take you one turn. Um, how long does it take for a character to come and search this room carefully for secret doors along the perimeter wall? That might take you 10 minutes to get your way over to here, and another 10 minutes it might take you two turns to search. Or maybe you want to search this upper platform up here to see if there's anything hidden behind this large orc, you know, bugbear god statue or something. Maybe you want to check every single torch. So round is different in the way I run it in combat as it is in just running around goofing off. And here's how I would uh, differentiate that. It's not one rule to rule them all. So if you have a situation where these two guys are attacking you, right, and you're fighting these two dudes, you use segments. So let's say that Mercedes got to do her attack first, and she rolls a d20 to hit, and then she does some damage, and she, you know, she's a two-handed weapon, and first edition it does 3d6 damage to single guys, and you're rolling damage, you're keeping track of the damage, you're looking at, you know, the roll to hit numbers for the bugbears, what's going to take for them to hit you, and you're doing all the combat, right? And that's just going, you, you'll hear me say, a round. What it really is is a segment. And the reason why I like to do it that way versus a lot of other people is in the original game, and there's a whole essay on this in the, for, in the player's handbook and the DM's guy. In the original game, here's what they say around this. Mercedes comes forward. She's got her two-handed sword. This guy, they make multiple attacks against each other for over a minute. And then ultimately, there's one kind of swing that kind of gets through her defenses. So if you're watching UFC fights or MMA fights, if you have a championship fight, the headlining event on a pay-per-view card, there's five five-minute rounds. So if you were to turn that into first edition D&D &D, uh, fight, Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz or something, one round in a UFC fight is five minutes. That would only be five rounds in D&D. &D. But I like to break that down into six-second segments, which is makes it more interesting. Then you can have a much faster-paced combat happening. Also, if you do that kind of a time acceleration, you need to change all the spellcasting times too. So, but if you want to keep it simple, um, just think of it as this, just like in the fifth edition, that when I run up and I'm going to take a swing at you, she's doing a big heavy overhand swing. She's, maybe she's trying to hit both these guys simultaneously while swinging from the right to the left like that. She takes a swing, you roll a d20, see if it connects. There's a 19, hits the first guy, doesn't hit the second guy, the guy evades out of the way, whatever. Maybe she rolls a complete one and she flubs and she misses and she's out of position and swings her sword and hits this. This guy can flank in behind her, attack her from behind, she's flat-footed. All that kind of stuff is happening, right? That's what makes combat immediate and exciting is when the little subtle moves of I took a swing at you and you moved out of the way and he dodged to the right and parried it and deflected it and knocked me off balance. So it's much more like a Mortal Kombat kind of a fighting game or like PvP in an MMO. That kind of combat is exciting. Having a situation where characters are clanging and banging against each other for a whole minute is, uh, is okay if you wanted to play a war game like Squad Leader or Panzer Leader or you're playing Warhammer 40K or you're playing uh, Bolt Action or any other games by Warlord and Osprey. But for D&D, it's much more exciting to have that six-second segment. Later on, characters will get higher level and they'll get what's called multiple attacks per round. So when you get really good and have a lot of prowess, your Mercedes with a two-handed sword, she might get two attacks every three rounds. She might do like a slashing move and then a stab with the weapon, pull the weapon back, gather her balance, and then do another attack. So going back to surprise, okay? So we're going to do this original situation. Mercedes jipping down the hallway. This guy's standing at the fountain. She sees him. He sees her. We roll for surprise. Look at this table I've got highlighted on the right-hand side, right? 
let's say, let's do the roll one more time. This is her roll. She rolls a two, which is really bad, and he rolls a one, which is bad. So that in that situation, um, if the players roll a one and the monsters roll a two, the party is considered surprised. So that means that he can actually take an action. But if you look at this little table here, okay, the difference is only one, so you only lose one segment, which basically means he gets the first attack. Now, because of that, that means she can't change positions. She can't move. So he's going to be able to go one, two, take two steps. Now, unless that were to happen way over here. So if she's over here and he's over there, there's no way he can move all the way across the space, even if there's one segment. But if it was two segments, he might be able to make it. Now, this is one thing about combat in first edition you have to think about. Not only is there things dealing with the surprise scenario, then you got to think about time, and then you got to think about movement. And movement in first edition is also kind of a little strange. You'll see in the monster manual there's things that say that uh, you know players move at 12 inches. That's the marker for inches, right? You'll be like, what? What does that mean? Do they mean 12 inches on the table? No, it's not like Warhammer 40K where you take a tape measure and measure things out. What they're trying to say is. 12 inches is basically 120 feet per turn in um, in combat. So if you divide that again, that means you can only move 12 feet when you're engaged in melee combat. So that means if I'm fighting you and you're fighting the bugbear and we're shuffling positions and fighting and going back and forth, we could possibly take a move and move 12 feet away and it might happen a little bit like that. Now what you'll see happen with me when I run the campaign on the YouTube channel I give people 20 feet of movement when engaged in combat and then normal movement rate when they are not engaged in combat. Now what's the difference? If this guy's actively charging forward to attack me, 20 feet is four squares. So let's just pull this out of the way here. So we're using a five inch, uh, one inch grid here. Let's just draw this on top here so you can see a little bit better. A one inch grid like any battle map, each one of these is five feet, okay? So it takes one, two, three, four. This is 20 feet. This is like the distance from the basketball court free throw line, okay, to a basketball rim. Here's the top of the rim. Here's Michael Jordan shooting a free throw. So to give you an idea, that's about 15 feet. So it's very easy in your mind, if you go to your high school or your college or wherever you are, you obviously, within six seconds, if you're trying to defend someone, trying to drive the lane in a basketball game, it'd be very easy for you to strafe left with your legs bent and move 15 feet. You see that happen all the time in pro basketball games. It's not like football where someone's running in a straight line trying to catch a ball. Think of it as movement in basketball where people got their legs bent, they're holding up a weapon, they're holding up a shield, they're trying to actively defend. So what I like to do is give, when if someone says there's a standard movement rate of 12 inches, instead of being 12 feet per segment, I round it up to 20 feet. That means that she can move forward and this guy can move less. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Let's take a look at the monk Elephanisi that's in our story. Now monks in first edition get an incredible movement rate, okay? Let's take a look at her real quick. She's right down here. Notice her movement rate says 24. That's going to be on the right hand side halfway through where my mouse cursor is around her sleeve. If you look at the fighter, the movement rate's 12. Look at Zalarus, movement rate's 12. Look at Varenjar, movement rate's 12. These are all humans you know, whatever. The movement rates, they're not overloaded with anything. The monk gets, she moves twice as far as a regular human because of how uh, much um, hand-eye coordination, athleticism, um, her acrobatic ability. So here's what could happen. Let's say there was a bugbear here and a bugbear here and you come running down the hallway, you and the monk are jogging down the hallway, and you see them, and you yell, let's get them, and the bugbears go, oh, crap, and they're going to try to run. Let's say they're standing at the fountain, they try to say, oh, forget this, and they're going to try to run. So let's say you win the initiative. So they can only, let's say they move standard movement rate. I'd have to look it up in the player's handbook, I'm not going to, but let's just say they move, they say they were humans. You know, in fact, forget them being bugbears. Let's just say there's these two barbarians here, right? Where's this other, I got another mini. Here's two barbarians. They say, forget this, let's get out of here. We heard about these two. So these two barbarians start trying to take a step and run away. So Mercedes gets to go one, two, three, four. And Elfenisi gets to go one, two, three, four, five. And she could even, she wanted to, six, seven, eight. So Elfenisi can move twice as far as Mercedes. So Mercedes can only move this distance here. And Elfenisi can move all the way from here, which is twice as far. And that means she could also move this far twice as fast 
So that's something to consider, okay? If you ever race two motorcycles or race a couple cars or race bicycles together, not only can she move a further distance, she can move that distance quicker over a period of time. So if this guy goes one, two, three, four, she's going these guys two run down the hallway, she's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. she's actually right on top of them. And Mercedes would be here. So after six seconds, Mercedes got her two-handed weapon running. These two guys turned and fled, and Elefanisi is going to be able to catch them quite handily. So that's one thing about a monk that's so powerful is their movement rate so high. Now, a regular character, you have the same movement rate. They get the head start on you unless you have a, uh, some kind of way to stop their movement rate. You're never gonna you're never gonna catch up to them. Okay. So time and movement and distance is a critical thing to think about. So. You had this first situation happen. Let's just use the barbarian character here. You roll for surprise. Let's say she's here. Let's say that say that he rolled a he rolled a six and you rolled a one. The worst case possible. Okay. Looking back at the dungeon master's guide again on page sixty one, that means if the party rolls a one and the other side rolled a three or a six, that means the party is considered surprised. But the differential here is. Um, three so you lose three segments of combat that's actually three rounds of attack that means this guy can the first round one two three four and in range to take a swing he'd be able to swing once twice three times before she's able to gather her uh defenses enough um, to defend herself in any kind of special way meaning that she wouldn't move so he's so quickly gotten her face and overwhelmed her she just had to focus on completely defending and couldn't do anything else it doesn't mean she's dropped her guard and he gets to one shot her and kill her really easily it means that she's not able to um, uh, defend herself in the same kind of way she would normally okay let's just make sure we got this set here right okay so um, surprise is nasty surprise is crazy surprise only happens once only happens one time, only once, only once, only when people are first seeing each other. And you DM may be kind of like, ah, not really sure what happens here. Think about where characters are. In fact, let's put her here, right? Let's say the barbarian guy is at this well, looking into the well. Where is he facing? He's looking into the well. He can see everything in this peripheral vision. Let's say the rogue came in the room, Varenjar came in the room, hidden shadows, and he sneaked around this column and could see this guy is here, and he want to walk all the way behind him and then pop a backstab. He's guaranteed surprise. You don't need to roll it. So you don't need to roll it in that situation. Now, you don't roll for surprise in that scenario. He's dropping out of, completely dropping out of shadows like in Stealth and World of Warcraft. Um, this guy would be a surprised backstab attack on him. So let's do another situation. Let's say that the druid is coming down the hallway, and he's standing here looking in the fountain, looking for coins in the fountain or something. And this is his line of sight, about a 90-degree frustum of view that he can see. And when she gets to here, there's enough vision where he could see her, and she could see him. And if she were to roll a 6 on her surprise roll, and he were to roll a 1, she could actually pull up and cast Entangle, and entangle this entire room, and he would be snared and wouldn't be able to run away. And she could be able to just nuke him down, put Wall of Fire on him, or whatever she wanted to do. Or her friends could come whipping in the room around her and catch him and then they melee him down. So the surprise roll can change the tide of a battle. Now go back and watch my show on the Ranger. The Ranger is probably the most overpowered class in the first edition in terms of surprise. The second most over, I don't have a Ranger in our, in our uh, story part. The second one most overpowered is the Monk. Um, the, the reason why the Monk is so overpowered at higher levels is the movement rate. So even if someone tries to flee from you, you're going to catch them. And then she can stun them in the back and things like that. So now, let's just make a quick summary. So first thing you got to do is you got to do surprise. Just roll 1d6 for that. You want a high number, okay? You want a high number, and it's not modified by anything. If you, when you get ready to roll initiative, let's do a couple of initiative rolls here, okay? Then you roll 3d6, the same number of dice you would roll to roll a character's uh, ability score. Let's say we had this barbarian, and he's going to take, and he's going to fight this uh, cleric here, Antola. So the cleric is here, and here's the barbarian. Let's roll the initiative for the bad guy. He's got a three, four, and a five total. You want high numbers now. High numbers win. And this is a five and a five. A ten is eleven. Now, if Antola had high dexterity, okay, let's just pull his sheet up real quick. He would have a bonus to his uh, reaction attacking adjustment. In this situation, um, let's take a look at him. He doesn't. But if it was Ella Fenisi and she was by herself and she's a monk, right, let's just swap her out. 
she's got plus two to her roll. So this roll, which is for her, is going to get plus two because her high dexterity. You see that first number there, well, her 17 dexterity, it says plus two reaction attacking adjustment. So that affects your surprise roll. And it affects your, I use it for the initiative roll only. I don't use it to use the surprise roll. Excuse me, I misspoke there. So let's say she wins the initiative. Now, these two start fighting. That means she gets to go first. And if he tries to disengage, you can give him a pack of opportunity that she gets to swing at him while he tries to disengage. There are rules in the DM's guide that have complexity saying, but you're actively defending, and you can make you can play it that verbatim if you want to, but the attack of opportunity I think is probably the best way to do it. The person can't truly defend and take steps backward and outdistance you. It's not like you're gonna stand still planted like a crusader in Diablo and take the hits. So um, once the fight starts, you just keep rotating and trading turns. He gets he gets to roll. He's going to roll a d20 to hit you, do damage. You're going to roll d20, do damage. Their, their next round goes. Then he rolls, then you roll. And you just keep taking turns. Keep taking turns till somebody decides to move or die. Where things change is when someone else comes in the room and something else happens. So let's say Ella Fenici is engaged with a barbarian. He's got a lot of health. He's fighting. And then we have Zollers comes in the room. And then we have Phil Cherna come, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Mercedes comes in the room, and at the same time, we have these bugbears come whipping up the hallway here to join with their barbarian leader or something, right? So they come pouring into the room. So now we have an interesting situation. And then as a bugbear captain comes whipping down the hallway here. So this is where it gets kind of tricky. So you got a bugbear captain comes whipping down the hallway here. We got a bunch of chumpy bugbears happening over here. And our party is over here. And put this light on here so you can see. That here's the barbarian fighting Elephanisi. So let's just pull this around this so you can see the little detail a little bit better. Let's turn it from this angle here, right? We'll turn this light off here in the background. So what do you have? You have these two are already engaged in a fight and they're trading turns, okay? Now we have these two fresh characters have come into the fight and they see these bugbears and those two are gonna make attacks. So the, this is a group and these two characters are kind of a group. <laughs> She's spinning around to me. And then you have this other dude way back over here and he's his own group. So that's an interesting situation. So unless this guy tries to disengage from Ella Fenici, he's going to stay tied up in combat with her and she's probably going to stick with him. But Mercedes is going to see him and he's going to see him. He could say as a player, this bugbear captain runs room and yells out commands to inspire his buddies and they all start getting ready to attack him, right? So let's get a shot of what that looks like. So these guys may all rush forward like this and start trying to engage them in combat and block the room so they can't get around. This guy may stay in the back line. So you may have a situation where Mercedes is going to take a swing and she's got two bugbears within swing range and Zolorus uses his uh, burning glaive and tries to jam this guy with his glaive and the bugbear captain's yelling and then the barbarian tries to pull back and Elephant EC pulls forward and he might rush forward and try to assist the barbarian. So as you can see, things can get tricky quick. So what started out, you see my markers that are on the table there, what started out as a simple fight, okay, between two characters soon becomes a grand melee, a big mess. So how do you change that? How do you deal with that? Here's what you do. As long as nothing changes, like the, I said a moment ago, remember how I said that the, bar, the bugbear captain came and joined in on this fight? So the moment that happens, the next time everyone's had their turn, we're gonna, this, these are considered a group because they're all within range of hitting each other with their melee weapons. And as long as these guys keep fighting, they're all within their group. Let's say over the course of the next few minutes or so that, uh, let's say that Mercedes and Zolaris, um wipe out some of these bugbears. Let's say the first two lives and the first two lines are killed, and this guy ends up staying, and when he kills him, the killing blow, he gets to step on top of the corpse and press forward, and she presses forward, and this guy shuffles back and tries to flee. So now we have a situation where Mercedes says, I'm just going to follow him. He's going to take a swipe of her. She goes by, and Zollers is just going to take a step here and engage in combat here. So then we have a scenario where let's say that Mercedes is chasing this guy down the hallway, and Zollers is engaged with this. Now we have another situation that's happened. So these two are a group. When I say group, I'm talking about when you're going to roll for initiative, who gets to go first. This guy engaged with this bugbear is now going to be a group. Okay, and this over here remains a group. Let's say that the say that the bugbear captain comes up and gets stunned and knocked on the ground. So let's go back and take a look over here. What's going on over here? So these two are fighting, and say she kills this guy. Boom, dead. He's lying on the ground, dead. And she runs over here to do a coup de gras and kill this guy. And as soon as she walks down the corridor, there, let's say two more bugbear captains come whipping down the hallway. Now this is where things are getting really complicated, right? 
just turn some of these lights back on. The, um, so now let's take a view of that, right? So now we have another situation. These two guys have entered the fight as a group, and El Fenisi is by herself as she's finishing killing this guy, and she they she they, she wipes him out and kills him. Now he's put a tab on the ground to say he's dead, and he's put a tab on the ground to say this guy here is dead to get the figure off the board. Um, now we have another situation going on. Say now go back over here. Now these all these turns are happening. Mercedes wipes out and kills this guy, and then she can turn around and rejoin this fight here. So every time someone joins the whoops joins the fight or disengages from the fight, what you need to do is think of them as um, groups. Okay, so not because they're grouped together like a party in World of Warcraft doing a raid instance or a heroic dungeon together, but think of them in terms of how do we handle the initiative between them. And here's something else to consider. Do you remember in the very beginning when I was saying that the Barbarian was fighting Elephant and it's just the two of them fighting? That's a situation where you want to use the uh, reaction attacking adjustment ver uh, modifier. See, hers is plus two. Let's say, let's do that right now. Let's say this is the first time they're attacking. The black dice is for the Barbarian, and we'll do the three for, the, for Elephant AC, right? So what do we got? The black, uh, the black dice for the Barbarian, he gets six. Six and five is 11. And two more is 12, 13, and she rolls a 5 and a 5 and a 1. Oh, this is a great roll. Well, this is 10, this is 11, but she has plus 2, so this is a 13, so this is a tie, okay? So what you'd want to do is do the first attack for her and for main hand and off hand, and then give the other guy his d20 roll, and whoever damages the other person the most that round, you could have them win the initiative because the other person has had to focus on defending, or when the damage is done simultaneously, then what you want to do is roll initiative again clean for the next round to have a clear winner. So say that he hits her for 10 damage and she hits him for 12 damage, the next round roll initiative for him, so he gets 6, 7, 8, 9, and a 10, and for her, 4, 5, and this is 8, and 9, plus the 2, 11, 12. So she would win, you know, maybe she wins that one, and then she gets attacked first. Now, now that there's a clear winner, keep those, keep these two rotating back and forth. She goes first, he goes second. So she attacks, he attacks, she attacks, he attacks, until long and nothing changes, as long as no one else doesn't enter the battle and start trying to participate in the fight, as long as no, someone else doesn't stand here in the back and start casting spells, you know, if you have some evil wizard girl coming here on the screen and start saying she starts trying to cast whole person, that's where things change. That's when the enemy becomes, this becomes an enemy group versus Elephanisi by herself. And when she's by herself, she should get her reaction attacking adjustment to her initiative rolls. So initiative rolls use 3d6. Surprise rolls only happen once, use 1d6. I'm going to stop right there and leave it at that because that's about, I don't know, um, 32 minutes of discussion of initiative and time and melee rounds. So one quick thing I'll go over before we get any further is how do you determine how do you hit someone? Well, in first edition, they have tables in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Let's go look at the tables real quick. So in the Dungeon Master's Guide, there are combat tables. You can get a um, DM screen. You've heard of a DM screen before? Everyone likes to have a DM screen when they're playing the game. The combat tables look like this in first edition okay so what are those things these tell you the numbers you need to hit to hit something based on armor class so we're just gonna keep it simple here bugbear and some say level 5 fighter versus bugbear okay so say the level 5 fighter won the initiative and he's gonna take a swing at the bugbear the bugbear captain so we got a bugbear captain right here let's just say turn this to the sheet so you can see it the bugbear captain has uh, armor class of four, okay? So look at the table. So we have a fighter. So we go down to this table down here. This is table 1B. And you can write this down as a to hit AC0 number on your character sheet once you figure it out. So look at the AC0 line, which is this one right here. Say this guy's a level five fighter. To hit AC0, he needs a 16. For every armor class lower, the number goes down by one. For every class armor class higher, in first edition, negative 10 is incredibly good, and 10 means you're wearing nothing. So let's say we said the guy was AC4, so you could look at the table, it's all pre-calculated for you, but you can just do it in your head. So his Thaco, or to hit AC0, is a 16. If this guy's AC4, he only needs a 12, okay? So once you, what you'll find I do in the show is I write this down, I write the, uh, um, to hit AC0 numbers down on all the characters. That way we can quickly, you probably heard me do it, quickly do the math. So Mercedes level 12 to hit AC0, she only needs a 6. That means in a lot of characters that are AC4, she only, she only misses on a 1, which is brilliant, right? So 
Now the bugbear, what's the bugbear going to take to hit the barbarian? Let's say the barbarian's wearing uh, studded leather or AC6 or some junk like that. So they use a different table. If this had been, uh, if he had been a thief, hit AC0, level 5 thief, to AC0, he needed 18, as a cleric, excuse me. The thief table is down here, level 5 thief, it's going to need a 19. So it's harder for non-fighters to hit monsters. It's um, fighters, paladins, rangers, and bards um, have great chances to hit. Then you have clerics and druids and monks. They do really, really well too. Magic user and illusions are the worst. And the third one in line is the thieves and assassins. So they're not supposed to be frontline fighters. Now, let's talk about the monsters. We were just about to say that, right? The next page, you have this assassination table. Ignore that for now. Um, then you have attack matrix for monsters. So let's say the bugbear is what? Hit dice five. So you got a hit dice five bugbear captain. To hit AC zero, I got it written on here already, is a 15. Let's just double check that. Here it is right there. You see it right there in the middle? So he only needs a 15. So let's say this guy is armor class. Let's make a few numbers for you. Let's say this barbarian is armor class five. So if he only needs a 15 to AC zero to armor class five, just take five away it means he only needs a, a 10. So let's say the bug bear takes a swing and he rolls a 15, he lands a hit on the guy. Now let's say that we had a druid like um, Filcherna, she comes zipping up and she's engaged in combat and her armor class is zero. So that means this guy needs a 15 or higher, that's an equals to 15 there, he, then he hits her. Um, let's say that we have Zolaris this guy, this bugbear is trying to hit Zolaris. What's Zolaris got for an armor class? Negative one. So to hit AC zero, okay, we've got it written down here, two hit AC zero. They call it Thacko. He needs a 15. That means he needs a 16 to hit Zolaris. So in this case, you roll the 12, it means he completely misses. Now, the miss doesn't mean like stumbles and falls. I've got a whole discussion about how to do flubs and critical hits. So when you're doing combat, you're rolling to hit. It's representing a quick little fight happening in six seconds. As soon as the hit happens, do the damage, mark the damage down, and when and only have to re-roll initiative when the scenario changes dramatically, such as maybe another bugbear comes and gets involved, or another another person on your uh, Vrenjar comes and gets involved. There's a different group here. When people are off fighting separate in separate locations, you can use their individual initiative rolls, right? But when they are all grouped up as a group. Um, that's when you want to treat them as a group. So that's pretty much how the combat flows. Keep it simple. Don't do anything crazy. Um, there's no there's no skills or there's not any DC checks in first edition. You don't have to do that kind of stuff. You can use the ability scores, make your own checks. You'll see in some of the shows I do, I'll do some things where like I'll have all these. Let's say the Vrinjar was mowing through and killing all these bugbears. There's only one guy left. I'll do a morale check. I'll say, well, listen, this guy has 10 intelligence. If he rolls a, a d20, um, 10 or less, he's smart enough to know to run away. If he rolls 10 or higher, he's stupid enough and fights to the death. There's a natural 20. He's stupid enough. He thinks he can step forward and avenge his fallen brothers, and then Vrinjar slaughters him, and he dies fruitlessly. So that's a rule I made up, okay? Now, there are rules about morale in the Dungeon Master's Guide, but they're complicated, and they're very, they can very much slow things down. But it's worth reading. So just, you know, if you got the PDF version, open up the bookmark tab on the left-hand side and read through how Gary Gygax originally designed it to handle it morale. And if you can memorize it, then do it. There's nothing wrong with that. But to keep things flowing, I like to do ability score checks. Ability score checks are a really fantastic way. That's like Task and Traveler, Mega Traveler. It's a really fantastic way to get quick resolution to things that make sense. Like, for example, you heard me arbitrarily say that the bugbear has 10 intelligence. Another DM might say the bugbear has 6 intelligence. Um, that someone else might say one bugbear has 12 intelligence. It might change everything. One DM might say that, hey, I want, this, I want to roll from morale. I'm going to do a 3d6 roll versus 10 intelligence, which is e uh, harder to do because there's less. Uh, it's easier to do because the between uh, 3 and 18, 10 is higher and closer to 18. You're more likely to succeed at that. Like these roll, I said it here, is twist is a 15, so he would succeed this role. What if you do with a d20? Um, the odds are a little different. You have three that's just thrown out because the ability score will be lower than three, but you have two numbers higher, so it kind of moves the mean and the average into the middle, but it's simple, and everyone loves roll a d20 anyway, right? So that's pretty much it. Surprise. The difference between, once you determine who's surprised, see what the differences are. That gives a, uh, one group an opportunity to do a number of attacks. Um, keep things by groups. 
roll initiative, change initiative rolls if you lose track of things, which is I've you see me do that too. Or when the situation changes, like guys all these dudes all get killed, and this bugbear is fighting Zolaris and he wants to step over the bodies and run and attack him. So that's a completely different initiative roll that doesn't interfere with the two attacks here unless he decides to change targets and that might change the situation. So use the initiative rolls to just determine who gets to go first. Um, and there you have it. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy to do. I, you, you won't have to look up these matrices in the book very often. Um, a lot of the old war games, you just have to look up, you know, what's it going to take for the Panzer Tiger 88 millimeter to hit this group of soldiers in the second story building with 50% concealment. You don't have to do all that. Just use a lot of common sense and everything should be working smooth and fast and clean for you. In fact, the more you play first edition, you're going to ultimately always know how much damage a short sword does and a rapier does and a two-handed battle axe. You're going to memorize how the armor class of a bugbear and a hill giant and a frost giant and a drow elf and the thing that's going to get tricky is when you start doing spell casting. And that's one thing I would like to talk about in another episode is how do I handle spell casting, um, which I do much differently in terms of how long it takes to cast the spells than how they're described in the player's handbook, and that's because of a time issue. So we'll leave it at that for now. If you like this, dude, let me know. This is cool. If you have any more questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to explain them to, the, to you. Um, maybe the next one I'll talk about flubs and natural 20s and things like that and double damage and... Um, but it's pretty much just uh, common sense, and you, all you really need to do is just remember what it's going to take for your roll to hit, understand the relationship to your armor class, do a little basic math, keep the initiative rolls and surprise rolls clear, and there you go. You can have a ton of fun, and you'll find that when you get really, really good at playing, it's almost like Diablo 3, you'll have a massive battle happen in a room, and in 20 minutes, 15 things have been killed. So it's a lot of fun, and uh, you know, have a great time with it, and if you have any more questions or comments, let me know, dude. Talk to you later.